May 16th, a Saturday, I awoke feeling ill. BG, my husband Bruce. BG, I said weakly, take the children out and let me rest. I'm exhausted. He looked in on me, gathered Westy and Lindsay, then ages three and seven, and left for a long walk at an old estate in town. By Sunday evening, I was on the verge of delirium, and Monday morning was no better. Wendy, get dressed, said Bruce. This is no ordinary flu. We're going to the hospital. Okay, I said as I struggled to sit up in bed. But then, a frightening problem presented itself. BG, I can't walk. I have interspersed uh, my chronicle with excerpts from my medical record. Uh, and because I have no memory of the time between May 16th and June 8th that year, I had to piece the story together from interviews with uh, the people who were with me at the time, family, friends, clinicians, and by studying my four inch thick medical record. This is from the medical record of our local hospital on May 18th. The patient returned to emergency room where I had driven over the weekend but did not recall, with progressive headaches, confusion, neck and leg stiffness, inability to walk, temperature 103, lumbar puncture performed, Urologist suggests brain stem dysfunction advised to Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. Can everyone hear okay? Um, okay. May 19th, after arriving at BI, I was placed in the medical intensive care unit where Dr. Dory Zelesnik, an infectious disease specialist, launched the therapy of antibiotics and antiviral drugs. After a time, Bruce asked her what antibiotics I was being given. Her cryptic answer, all of them. Thus began the roller coaster ride. Bruce was now more certain than ever that I did not have the flu. May 20th, Judy Adderstrom stopped in mid stride. She put down the forms she had been holding and stared at the inert shape on, on the bed. Her new patient, a mother of two young children, had been wheeled in with nearly all her systems already shutting down. An intensive care nurse for 18 years, Judy faltered. I rarely hesitate, she would tell me later. I've been doing this work for so long. But sometimes I just have to look inward and assess my ability to take on certain cases. I started to sign in, but had to stop and think. Here is a woman with young children and in very bad shape. It's not at all clear if she'll make it. I just wasn't sure I could handle it. Some cases are like that. I don't hesitate very often, but I thought this one might be a real emotional ringer. I walked around the hospital for a half hour or so. I just had to figure out if I was up to it. In the end, I signed on because I realized that if I didn't do it, someone else would. A certain nurse on staff who was good, but single. Like Wendy, I had young children and thought, I can do better. I'll be able to relate to her better. For several days, the doctor suspected the nature of my disease to be infectious. Because of the aggressiveness of the disorder and my swift deterioration, they were especially concerned with the possibility of Eastern equine encephalitis. It is unusual for someone to get so sick <coughs> so fast. With our home in proximity to beaches and horse country on the North Shore, Lyme disease was another consideration. Dr. Tom Scammell, the tenacious young research doctor and Harvard professor named to head my case, called Bruce at home to ask about ticks. He and his colleagues were trying to determine what sort of infection I might have. Medicine is good at treating infections. They hoped they could identify this one quickly. Meanwhile, the EEG on May 21st showed slowed brain waves. Functions of my brain were becoming progressively more impaired. Gradually, I drifted off and lost consciousness. By the time my mother arrived from Michigan on May 22nd, I was nearly fully comatose. Earlier that day, an anesthesiologist had intubated me, a sight neither mom nor Bruce had yet seen. He placed an endotracheal tube in my nose that passed through my trachea into my lungs. It was attached to a respirator or vent. I had also acquired a feeding tube, which went through my mouth and into my stomach. Thus, there were tubes going into my nose and mouth and tape over my face to hold them in place. In the days that followed, there was very little hope for me at BI as they ran test after test, and my MRIs kept coming back normal, eliciting no clues whatsoever as to what was wrong and how to treat it. Judy handed my wedding rings to Bruce one afternoon. Another day, she asked if I had a living will. Bruce finally brought himself to speak with our minister. There I was, at one of the greatest hospitals in the world, the most impressive care and attention directed to my case, my doctors. 
Harvard Medical School professors all searched diligently to determine what should be done. But the medical mystery persisted. As hard as they tried, none of them, from their range of specialties, could make a diagnosis. And without a diagnosis, they could not initiate a treatment. Almost by the hour, I was slipping away. In the words of Dr. David Trentham, the rheumatologist, within the universe of highly unusual cases, this one stood out as a diagnostic dilemma of the first order. The situation was so very confounding because of the rapidity with which the coma came on. Nothing seemed to fit, like we were trying to take a round peg and fit it into a square hole. We thought, what mutant virus was destroying this person? Once the once the coma set in and it became apparent that the antiviral and antibacterial therapy was not resulting in progress, the emphasis shifted to neurology. Also at this time, about May 24th, the doctors explained that they wanted to make some changes so that I would be more comfortable. A tracheostomy was required to ensure that my breathing would continue without interruption and a tube inserted into, inserted into my stomach for nutrition. From these adjustments, my family understood no one knew how long I would be in a coma or when or if I would emerge from it. Meanwhile, family and friends were trying everything they could think of to reach me. Thinking their strong fragrance might possibly awaken something in me, Bruce placed a huge bouquet of stargazer lilies at my bedside, flowers he courted me with on Martha's Vineyard years earlier. He brought in a beautiful picture of our children that he hoped I would see upon awakening. He was trying to make sure that the doctors and nurses attending me would gain a sense of the life he hoped could be saved. He called all of my doctors and all of our friends who are doctors, our old friend Elliot Burson, again of Harvard and Mass Eye and Ear, strongly encouraged Bruce's natural tendency to play an active role, to observe, monitor, and make suggestions. He told Bruce that advocacy is very important. That assurance coming from Elliot and license that it was the correct thing to do carried great weight. My mother later wrote, Bruce was so sad, we drove into Boston every day, and he was always on the phone trying to find someone who had the knowledge to see you through this. As soon as he felt he was making some progress, his spirits picked up. He talked to the doctors about similar illnesses and treatments that had brought people back to health. The doctors, bless them, listened to all Bruce could tell them. I am sure that my persona as a wife and mother became more real as a result of Bruce's advocacy, particularly in one area, it was Bruce who, with the doctor's blessings, arranged for my coma sitters, a few of my closest friends and family who came to the intensive care unit to sit and simply talk to me, whose familiar voices, he hoped, might possibly trigger something. What followed were more days of testing, more discussion about probable causes and possible therapies, but no positive findings. The medical mystery persisted. <coughs> I'm jumping ahead now to the morning of May 29th. Bruce walked into my room and found I'm sorry. Bruce walked into my room on May 29th and found Dr. Michael McLaughlin, head of the ICU, sitting in a chair by the window. I, as usual, lay motionless in bed the sounds of my labored, mechanically assisted breathing punctuating the quiet of the room. <coughs> we found some small lesions on the white matter of the brain, he quietly announced. Bruce was stunned, wondering how much more he could take. But the doctor quickly explained, it's actually good news. It could be the breakthrough, the clue we've been seeking. At last, the, lesion, the lesions that pointed to acute demyelinating encephalomyelitis, or ADEM for short, finally revealed themselves in this MRI that produced the first abnormal results, enabling the doctors to initiate treatment. Why the lesions were not apparent on the early MRI scans is a fascinating question, Dr. Scammell told me some months afterward. Clearly, your brain and spinal cord were malfunctioning early in your illness, but MRI scans, though amazing, are not perfect. MRI scans are good at detecting brain edema, the swelling that accompanies inflammation. Although your neurons were misbehaving, there may not have been enough edema early on for the MRI to detect. Usually in ADEM, the edema is very obvious. This may have been why the early MRIs kept registering normal results, compounding the mystery and dangerously hampering the diagnosis and search for treatment. As Dr. Scammell explained, bugs and ticks can cause neurological disease, 
but ADEM is best explained as a very abnormal response within the immune system. This pivotal discovery cleared the way for megadose steroid therapy that began in the afternoon of May 29th. Dr. Scammell ordered 1,000 milligrams of solumedrol to be administered intravenously, high pulse, for the next five days. The therapy began with hope, but there were no guarantees. It doesn't always work. But May 30th was a remarkable day. Dr. Scammell wrote in the medical record, small but remarkable improvement overnight. She now occasionally opens her eyes to voice, possibly followed midline commands, briefly fixed and followed my face. The overnight clinical improvement completely vindicated the MRI findings that revealed the lesions, as well as the conclusive diagnosis and decision to administer steroids. I began to regain consciousness. Although my EEG still showed a slowing of brain waves, there was, and there was concern about seizures, I continued to make progress. My slurred speech was a concern, but apparently I woke up trying. Friends noted that I never fretted, always tried to enunciate, to do better, to redo. But there was concern about how the ultimate damage would affect my ability to communicate. And although I had survived, a huge problem loomed. My central nervous system had been attacked, and I was quadriplegic. To one degree or another, the disease affected nearly all of my capabilities, mental and physical. And because there were so few recorded cases of ADEM, reliable prognostication was impossible. Shortly after I came out of the coma, one of the doctors told Bruce that I might begin to show some progress by Christmas. For the moment, though, one thing was certain. Dr. Scammell and his <coughs> crew's BI had defied seemingly insurmountable odds. Now I have a couple of slides to show. Um, so, that's what it looks like when you come out of a coma. <laughs> Part two of the book um, focuses on rehab and begins with a quote from Dr. Joel Stein, my primary doctor at Spalding. Privately, he said, I later learned, she will probably remain quadriplegic indefinitely. Well, obviously I had other ideas. <laughs> On the day of my admission to Spalding, my estimated length of stay was 12 weeks. But again, they didn't really know what to expect. My physicians at Spalding were as puzzled about the cause of my illness and uncertain about my potential for recovery as my team of doctors at BI had been. <coughs> Dr. Paul Sandu, Dr. Stein's resident fellow from Harvard, later wrote, in the literature, there are few cases of ADEM, and their causes are poorly understood. Your case was quite puzzling, and your evaluation revealed no clues as to what initiated the downward spiral and eventual paralysis. And not only was the condition rare, it had a great variance of recovery. Again, it was impossible to prognosticate with accuracy. Dr. Stein later said, on a personal level, it is always difficult to be confronted with someone with major neurological limitations, and this is amplified when the patient is young, intelligent and has a family with young children. Nonetheless, we are in the hope business, and I try to look at the positive aspects of every patient's situation. I've always loved that phrase about rehab, about being in the hope business. The baseline personality observation on my Spalding medical record, pleasant but confused. <laughs> I was also determined, and at least in the beginning, deluded as well. I never thought of myself as a quad. But Bruce and my clinicians were unfailingly gentle about this, playing along with my delusions as though I were a child. The focus was on getting me better, physically and mentally, if possible, but always with compassion. And because I seemed to ignore my impairment, I had one persistent thought from the beginning of my return to consciousness. I wanted to be back in Maine with my family. After all, it was summertime. One day, very early on in rehab, I had a distinct visualization from a memory of our old camp in Maine. But rather than visualize the beautiful view looking out from the camp, what I saw in my mind's eye was a vision of myself walking away from the camp, across the lawn and down to the dock. It was as though I were watching myself from the dock, a distinct impossibility. And long before anyone had the slightest notion that I would ever walk again, I later wondered if it might have been my willpower starting to crank up. In retrospect, it seemed like a mysterious gift. I began my rehab career by flopping in a wheelchair. 
With a seatbelt around my waist to keep me from falling over, I was wheeled down to the gym. It overlooked the Charles River and the extraordinary city of Boston. It was a glorious, sparkling view. Also, a constant daily reminder of my former life. The therapist propped me up on a raised mat. Two held me steady while the third worked with me. The very first task they set before me was curious. They put a large slate-covered box on my lap and sprinkled it with talcum powder then placed my arms on it and directed me to slide them over its surface as best I could. As a former competitive tennis player, I was initially puzzled by these activities. I wondered how such simple movements could add up to anything. Was this the right thing to do, I thought? Will it be enough? Do they know what they're doing? <laughs> <laughs> I actually thought that. But despite its minimal nature, therapy was incredibly arduous in the early days and weeks. I was not strong. I had lost 15 pounds. My muscles had atrophied in the coma, and I was seriously impaired, to say the least. <laughs> but there was no alternative. I had to get better. I had to get back home. Dawn explained what had to happen if I were ever to walk again. You first have to learn to sit with balance, then be able to stand with balance. Only then can we start to work on the walking. At a point when my trunk musculature was so impaired that I could not sit without flopping over, I posed a question to her. What are my chances, I asked, half embarrassed, looking up at her as I slumped over, of getting out of here without this wheelchair? She spoke to me as one would to a child. It's kind of early, we'll see. My first weekend at Spalding, after my regular caregivers had left, I set myself a private goal. I wanted to be able to hug my children and caress their heads. And so I worked constantly to try to bend my fingers and lift my arms. I actually thought that for some reason I could do that. And my fingers were uh, as stiff and straight as pencils from being splinted in a coma. I tried. But my insubordinate, leaden limbs would not respond to the signals that my brain and my will were sending them, quietly, furiously, without let up. I kept thinking and trying, visualizing, dreaming of the moment I would be able to do what I wanted. For hours that turned into days, I tried with all of my feeble might and persistent willpower to get my fingers to bend and to raise my arms. Nothing happened. I worked or tried as hard as I could before falling asleep, and then I would wake and begin again, over and over again. It just has to happen, I thought. I must be able to do this, it's so simple. I tried everything I could think of to get my fingers to bend and my arms to go up, hour after hour, day after day, nothing happened. But then, finally, miraculously, things did begin to happen. I think it began with the tips of my fingers, and starting with that small success, I gradually somehow got my fingers to bend. Then my elbows moved. Hour after hour, I worked, and then fell asleep. First thing Monday morning, June 15th, my nurse Teresa, back now after the weekend, stepped into my room. She took one look and shrieked, oh my God, as she pulled everyone she could into my room from the hallway. On Friday, I had been quadriplegic. Now. I was wiggling my fingers with my arms raised straight up in the air. <laughs> that was a very big deal. Big, very big day. <laughs> Despite my dramatic early progress, doctors were still unwilling to paint an optimistic picture, however. Spalding's neurologist took Bruce aside one day to outline possible scenarios. I think you should know that this progress might not continue, she warned. There are three possible outcomes. She could continue to improve. She could plateau, meaning her progress could end at any time. Or she could regress. We have to be cautiously pessimistic, and you should be prepared for whatever happens. But Bruce did not want to burden himself with speculation. And as Dr. Stein explained, when we know the natural history of a disorder, we have a good sense of how patients are going to do. But in Wendy's case, we still didn't know what had caused her condition. We took things day by day and tried not to over-prognosticate. In his progress notes for June 17th, Dr. Stein wrote, rapid neurological recovery continues. However, I was still quite weak and impaired. For an entire week at the beginning of my physical therapy, 
my blood pressure dropped dramatically during the workouts. This left me feeling dizzy and weaker than ever. Strength was crucial, but my impairment, weight loss, and muscle atrophy all worked against my regaining that strength that I needed so desperately to get better. Other stumbling blocks were a lack of food and sleep. But after my trach was removed, I was able to graduate to soft foods and gradually began to beef up a bit with the help of liquid calorie boosters administered directly into my stomach, all of which brought me closer to the most difficult physical task I would undertake. Learning to walk again, I actually place on par with childbirth, only it takes longer. I undertook numerous exercises to strengthen my trunk so that I could sit without flopping over. My hips were weak and uncontrollable. Muscles around my knees had a tendency to buckle or lock. After raising my arms that first weekend at Spalding, I set a second private goal to draw my knees up in bed. This seemed to be in the realm of possibility, but it took nearly a week to accomplish. Once again, I tried so hard to move anything I could, but my limbs still felt as if they were made of lead. I would draw my feet up a few inches in the bed, and then ever so slowly, my knees would follow. If these little victories keep coming, I explained to BG one day, they might just add up to something. Besides, I have plenty of time for practice. Next slide. This next slide, you might wonder what, how I could keep working. This is what kept me going. This was my great mo motivation. It's the photograph of our children that Bruce brought to me at Beth Israel, and of course it came with me as Spalding. Whenever I saw that picture, it made me work harder than I once might have thought possible. More than anything, I wanted to be mom again. By the end of June, my progress was swift and sometimes dramatic. Activities and exercises that were difficult on Monday became easier by Tuesday or Wednesday. I also became an exercise outlaw. You knew that, right? <laughs> Doing exercises I was warned against doing in my room for fear that I would fall. But I, the last to know. I thought for sure you knew. But I had, I, had, I had to keep working. I felt strongly that one or two hours a day of PT was not enough. But once I was able to sit with balance, I graduated to the standing table. A harness was buckled around my hips to hold me in place as I then reached forward from my wheelchair to heave myself claw my way up, actually, into a standing position, leaning forward against an inflatable form molded to the shape of my legs, my arms supported on a wide, chest-level shelf. I became lightheaded, just raising myself into position. Somehow, though, I managed the first time to stand for two full minutes before having to catch my breath and rest. Two days later, I was able to raise myself into position without the harness and stand for three minutes. The therapist seemed amazed so I knew I was making progress. The next order of business was my stance. There was so much to remember, to relearn, in order to achieve the proper stance in preparation for walking. I had to relax my shoulders and align them over my hips, which had to be over my knees, which had to be over my ankles, my feet not too close together, nor knees too close either. This was such tedious business, I had to practice standing, focusing so intently on all the nuances of proper stance, which of course I never had to think of before, took all of my concentration. But only then would I actually be able to move. But from there, I graduated to the walker. Laboriously, I would lift the device, move it forward, set it down, carefully take a small step, then lift it again to begin the sequence again and again and again. Slowly, haltingly, I made my way around the gym. July 4th was noteworthy not only for the fireworks over the Esplanade, but for the single worst night of my stay at Spalding. Exhausted, I fell sound asleep by 8.30 p.m. 45 minutes later, my roommate, Miss May, a sweet, confused, 96-year-old stroke patient, began talking to no one in particular in her native Chinese. The loud, disruptive monologue went on until 2.30 in the morning. When the nurses arrived for a 6 a.m. procedure, I was more exhausted than ever and distraught. I needed every ounce of strength I could muster, and I knew that a single sleepless night could translate into a setback. At PT that morning, I wasn't sure what I'd be able to do. We can work on some things that won't tax you too much, my therapist said. So I hobbled in my usual way with a walker around the gym and did a few exercises. At the end of our session, she brought my wheelchair around. 
I prepared to transfer into it to return to my room, but she had other ideas. Stand up and hold on to the chair, she quietly commanded as she set the chair in front of me facing out. Put your hands on the back of the handles and stay close. As instructed, I pushed my wheelchair the length of the gym and out the door. Now, she said, turn right and keep going. Well, the most magnificent feeling came over me. It's just like pushing a baby carriage, I exclaimed. I was walking. By mid-July, I had progress progressed to a cane and then to climbing stairs. First, I climbed half a flight of stairs and the following day, a whole flight and back down. Then I did two flights up and down, then four flights down to Spalding's basement and the treadmill. One warm summer day, my therapist took me outside. We're going to have you practice walking on uneven terrain, Dawn announced. Just as we began, a friend showed up with a bouquet of flowers from his wife's garden. He stayed for the entire therapy session, even though I couldn't carry on much of a conversation. I'm sorry, Greg, I can't walk and talk at the same time. I had to concentrate on every single aspect of my stance and movement. Another morning, soon after, Dawn found me standing unaided at the sink in my room, brushing my teeth. Aha, I caught you, she scolded. As I started to defend myself, I was being very careful. She made a glorious announcement. I actually came to tell you that you have just gotten your independent walking status. And from there, it was just a matter of days before my discharge on July 20th, five weeks and six days after my admission as a quad. There's one more slide. Here we are, Labor Day weekend, six weeks after I was discharged. So there's a lot more to the book that, uh, that I don't want to go into now um, on medical considerations, on what was going on more personally with, with my family and me and my heart and soul during that time, even you know, some spirituality and this, you know, the whole near-death experience. <laughs> um, but I want to stop now so you have time to engage these great clinicians who are with Termination was just remarkable. I, I do remember there was one interesting time when um, my speech seemed to uh, ability seemed to sort of regress um, after it had um, after I had started you know the, the, oops, the multiple therapies um, um, and I I began to stutter and I remembered thinking. That I, I I knew that it I knew that I wasn't actually regressing. Do you, do you remember that? It, and it, I think it, I think it was it had something to do with my 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 mind racing forward before my my ability to actually mechanically speak uh, correctly could could keep up with it. And and I your motor recovery was getting more and more. She was improving. There was a little phase where there was some disfluencies and stuttering because right. of speech productions past that and you know, she got stronger and motor recovery picked up with the whole physical. Do you mind just speaking right into the microphone? Sure. Stop. Thank you. <laughs> so I think her speech production improved as her whole physical um, functioning improved. And you know there was different phases of the recovery in terms of just beginning to speak at all in the beginning. Um, and then increasing her length of utterances and being able to communicate functionally, to express her needs, and her feelings, to her family, with the doctors and the therapists. So, I mean, it was uh, just a remarkable recovery and quite a process, a journey. What I remember one during this this um, this time <coughs> of a, a, a parent setback, uh, one thing that really helped me was somehow I figured out probably with a good suggestion good suggestions to slow just slow down and enunciate and that helped me kind of you know find a, a, a rhythm to get back on track and I remember talking to friends on the phone and when I would during this time when I would start to stutter and I would tell them not to worry that this is just this is okay it's just temporary I, I'm just uh, I'm working <coughs> at it you know as in rehab physical therapy speech therapy occupational you pretty much focus on restoration of lost function as well as compensation so things like slowing down so as you're learning to do these things again and uh, regaining function you're also working on compensating 
in the neurological and physical therapy program here, and I'm also a researcher. So I was interested in your comment that the medical team made about not having much literature on the condition to be able to understand what was going on. I was curious as to whether they learned from your case and published, contributed to the scientific body of literature related to this disorder. Uh, my, my neurologist at Small, I, I mean, at um, Beth Israel, I'm sorry, uh, did uh, publish a paper um, shortly after my illness and recovery. Um, and it's in the medical literature. I'm not named, but Dr. Scammell um, did publish something in it. Um, so it, it's in there. It's, they still don't know what caused this. They, my serums are at the CDC which I understand only takes serums if the local resources have been exhausted. And you know, if they're exhausted in Boston, they're really exhausted. Mm -hmm. and, and at this point, I, I think that um, they probably will never uh, de determine exactly what caused it. I think that what the doctors focus on is the fact that I got better and, and recovered. Wendy, these are, are mostly our students who are studying to become speech therapists, physical therapists, what have you. And I love the phrase that you said. Um, you love the fact that you heard the phrase, they were in the business of hope, which was a nice thing. And it's wonderful that you actually brought your therapist here to share the, the book event with you. But did you have any therapists, and we won't name names, so don't try to figure out who they are, who, who you felt really irritated you, annoyed you, just didn't work well with you, or you look back now and say, oh, the one that used to push me is the one probably that I really, you know, what kind of therapist? There was there was one therapist that I actually wrote about in the book, and um, I I sort of hope that he, he never sees it because I hate to hurt, to hurt his feelings. Um, but he, he, he was a, it was a real spirit killing episode because it was, um, I had started to recover rather dramatically, although it wasn't quite apparent yet at that point whether I would walk again or recover most of my um, former capabilities. And, um, you know, I was always questioning people and researching. And, you know, I brought up the subject of, of the, the return of the myelin, which was the, what was damaged, um, which caused my, my condition, the myelin sheath. Being damaged, and um, and you know he went into this um, little explanation about how you know the myelin just takes forever to return, and it returns to such a minute, you know, uh, in s s slow way, and 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 you know I just remembered saying, well, my gosh, you know I, I'm 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 really making progress. Are you sure about all of this? You know, it was just uh, uh, it wasn't until the end of our discussion, you know, that he he said something about, well, you know, it, it, it can return in pockets. It doesn't necessarily have to be a linear return. Um, and, but it was a, it was a spirit killer, you know, and, and I think that that was really the only time that I was distraught. And, and, and that's saying a lot because I couldn't really process emotion um, at the beginning, you know. My cognition was affected and, 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 and that was a good thing that I couldn't process emotion because I would have been a lot more distraught earlier on. Um, for example, when I first got to Spalding and I saw my, my young daughter for the first time in almost a month, my husband didn't want to bring her to Beth Israel because he was afraid that um, all of the paraphernalia, the tubes and whatnot would be um, frightening. And I couldn't hug her, you know. And I remembered asking him to just place her on the bed right next to me so that we could at least be touching. And, and you know, I just I couldn't hug her, and I remember feeling that I I, I wasn't able 
to do, you know, somewhat frustrated that I wasn't able to do what I wanted to do, but I wasn't distraught as I should have been. So, um, I think I'm rambling on it. <laughs> but, uh, so I may just add in a little, you know, we, um, working in rehab and working in the field that we do, we have to kind of tap dance across on that line of maintaining somebody's hope, but also not giving false hope. Um, you know, it would not have been beneficial for Wendy at the beginning if I said, yeah, I see you getting out of that wheelchair. You know, that was, this woman was in a recliner, tilt in space wheelchair, sitting like this, asking me, what's my chance of getting out of this wheelchair? So you do have to find that balance, you know, still building rapport is important to be able to um, get somebody's trust to then be able to deliver some of the <coughs> more realistic news um, of, you know, we can't just get you up walking. You need to be able to sit without two of us holding you up. And I, I think it's important, Wendy was the first patient I had ever worked with who had the diagnosis of, of ADAM. And I think, you know, we learn in our classes that you don't treat the diagnosis. We do our evaluations, you treat the impairments to get somebody then to move on into their participation in their life roles, and that's the key. It didn't matter what Wendy's diagnosis was. She had range of motion limitations, she had weakness, she had balance impairments, she had functional mobility, and, you know, that all led to her functional impairments. Um, and that's, that's really the key, so don't look at the diagnosis. No, I didn't know what the prognosis was going to be, but again, I, you know, and I, I, I think one of the biggest compliments that I can get from Wendy is I didn't diminish her hope, but I didn't set her up for unrealistic goals. And I think as clinicians, if we can all remember that in working with our, our patients, that, um, you know, that's, that's the best honor that we can give them and, and respect. Absolutely, I think I think Don was really masterful at, the, at precisely that that delicate balance, you know, between um, avoid avoidance of raising false hope and but not diminishing hope. Did you continue any rehab after you left? <coughs> oh yeah, I had. Um, I, had, I did outpatient uh, rehab at the local hospital in my town. Involved in, you, you know, you get involved having Bruce come in, and then when Westy and Lindsay came in, and being involved in having, you know, Wendy probably take her first steps toward the family. So you go back through all of these life events, and um, you know, to have somebody work with somebody who was so determined, and the more I pushed her, the more she did, and. The, crazier my ideas, the more she was willing to just say, all right, let's try it, you know, and again, putting her trust in somebody that she doesn't really know, but here we are coming in with a wheelchair and a sliding board and two of us to, to get her into the chair and, you know, Wendy at that point, if I may, was her thinking, probably, well, what are they doing with this board, you know, but what came out of her mouth was, Oh, you want me to get in the chair? I can, I can get into the chair. You know, so dealing with that aspect too of here we were <laughs> holding her up. So you know, there's the the level of some of the the insight, and sometimes it's really beneficial for people to not realize where they're at. And you know, uh, I, Wendy had mentioned kind of going along with whatever she was saying or thinking or wishing for, and you know, that goes again with not giving up hope. You know, if you need to kind of go along with some of the things they're saying, because the worst thing any of us could have done to this woman was crushed her, her first weeks in rehab. Because once we lose the spirit, we lose the person. So, um, yeah, so, you know, obviously Wendy is uh, one of those people 13 years later that I still have not forgotten. And when she called me down on the Cape and said, Dawn, it's Wendy Ford, I was like, Hey Wendy, how are you? <laughs> you know, and just and, and it was um, it was like I was back 13 years ago in, in Spalding having a conversation again. Same with me. I knew exactly who she was. All she had to say is, "Oh, it's Wendy." And <laughs> you right back to that time period. 
Well, I remember, I remember um, when I started uh, progressing so dramatically that um, one of my team um, said that it's so important to have that, uh, to have that will, um, to have that, that hope, and that the patient was the most important part of the team, really. Because if that will isn't there, well, um, it's a very sad thing. And you know, they brought me to, I was on a stroke floor because they didn't really know where to put me. And, um, and there are, there, there, there were patients on that floor that sometimes didn't have a lot of hope. And it was a very, it's a, and I could see that, you know, it's a very sad thing. Um, I don't know how you conjure it for people. That's, that would be the next great challenge, you know. But um, I'm just grateful that I had whatever I needed to work to make the best of my team, you know, to get back. Be like a calling because the patience and the understanding and the um, and the compassion that I experienced from these people it, it was just astounding, really. So you're all studying a wonderful course. So good luck to all. Of you. Uh, it's, it's definitely in here. I started reading it yesterday. I was researching for the introduction. I was on like page 40. Do you want to get to the library every day? I have. 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 I I'm sure. No, no, I agree. One of the doctors thought that my husband was going to be a student.